last project, I've just got two slides of this. Last project I'm showing you is something that's no further than these models. Now this is something that we often do for people like Alfred Taubman, where the money isn't there yet, the wherewithal is sort of there, the approvals aren't there yet, and you need something beyond a piece of paper that said, we intend to build a new transit village. Offices, housing, dormitories, retail, museum. All of that will be built here, supposedly. The banks will have to give, the developers will have to do what they do. Everybody gets on, in, on board, and we are now past the approval stages in West Palm Beach, Florida. For, Palm Beach, Florida. This is a very big deal. Alfred knows Palm Beach very well. In West Palm, it was always the community where the help for Palm Beach lived and then went across the bridge in the morning and served the other side. It's not like that anymore. This is a very desirable piece of property now. How things change. And a lot of hip kids live over here now and they're building good museums, good libraries and so on. But there is an existing uh, um, rail station right there from the 1920s, Deco. And it becomes the kind of cause lab for, for making something out of the railroad that comes into West Palm along this line there. And we're, we're designing a new science museum here. And these towers are to have a retail base. And when you walk along here or here, or within the project, you're supposed to be aware of all the kinds of things you would be aware of here. In other words, the ground plane again. Not these towers hovering over your heads, standing on plots of ground like Le Corbusier's Boisson plan. So we have given a base to all of that, and that's the lesson here. First of all, I wanted to build the base, which is nothing new in planning. And then the towers on top of them, because we had to have the we had to have the square footage just to pay the price for the base and the little museum which would be paid for by all of this development there. So it's a give and take through the whole thing and Mr. Taubman can tell us a lot more about it than I can. And here's another picture of it. So you have the low scale kind of gap and, and uh, various furniture stores and all of that down so people will be walking down at the lower levels here and back here there's a loja that continues along. You want to get out of the sun in West Palm so you'll be walking along there with retail on the side and probably uh, unaware of the towers up above you. The towers, residences and, and the, uh, offices? Offices, residences, both uh, condos and and uh, dormitories. And I'll show you all of this simply to take you back to go again where we started with the Noli plan and this is this is the kind of architecture that brings us back to Italy and to Paris and to all of those places all the time. This is a little restaurant called Il Giardino. You walk through the restaurant here, through the kitchen, and there's a little garden in back. Up above is a private dining room, and up above that the cook lives, and I presume his wife. Um, but this is a four-story building. All of this is three, four, five stories. Anything you can walk to. But this is really what drives the city. And when you walk on Madison Avenue in New York, of course you're aware of the towers and the people that live up there and the dentists and the architects and, well, architects can't afford Madison Avenue, but, but lawyers and the people that have offices there. But you're shopping, you're window shopping, you're saying hello to your neighbors, all of that, not to be too hokey about it. But this is what the city is about, retaking in the plan your buildings that you build for for people and, and interested parties like 
uh, Mr. Tom. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? No questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> I'm always good to start a question. Um, when you describe your work, uh, you're, you're of course describing it as an architect, but you're also describing it with, I think, a, a pretty profound understanding of spatial psychology the movement of people through space. Mr. Taubman uh, uh, referred to uh, Gordon Cullen's uh, book earlier as, as serial, serial movement uh, through the city and, and that sort of thing. You describe it in the same ways. How important is it for an architect, designer, to have an understanding of, of spatial behavior? Let me go, this is a perfect question. Go back one step further. How important is it for the architect to be educated? I mean, you guys have to read. You have to get into the library. You have to know who Gordon Cohen was. Why did he say that? Wasn't he just a guy that made renderings? Yes. But he made renderings based on an urban scheme. And he promoted this scheme through his drawings. Not through a lot of writing, there was some, but through drawings. But before that, why I say get educated, get smart, is that what Gordon Cullen was talking about was what the French Beaux-Arts architect knew, which was something they called the architectural march. Well, we would translate that into the march through architecture. Well, what does that mean? Well, what it means is this hierarchical understanding of space upon space, upon corridor space, and so on. If you were walking through the nave of the church with the aisles on either side, picture it in your mind, you know what's primary, you know what's secondary. Let's make it a Catholic church. And there's the baldacchino at the end, and that's a kind of altar. Around the altar is a pathway back to what we call the choir, where in fact the choir sat. And there are not pathways, but a very interesting route to get there. But first of all, there was the front door, and then there was the foyer, and then there was the nave, and then there were the view of the aisles, and then the baldacchino, and so on. I know you well enough now after an hour and a half. I can tell you this story. <laughs> Michelangelo was drawing the plans. This is a true story. He registered in his, in, his, in his poems. He was drawing the plans for the St. Peter's Basilica, one of many architects who worked on the St. Peter's, not just one. But the, the plans were shown to the Pope, who was his client. And the Pope, who was a very frugal man, said, what is this and what is that? He said, well, sir, those are, I'm sure he didn't say it that way, but your highness, these are the aisles. Oh, the aisles. You all know what an aisle is in a church, don't you? In St. Peter's, the aisle, the columns for the aisle are about a quarter of the size of this room in plan. The ones that support the dome are about the size of this room. So these are big mothers, right? right? <laughs> big mothers. And they have niches in them to put the saints. When somebody gives money to the church, they want to give blessings to the, the goddess of, of the arms, goddess of the legs, the goddess of gout, whatever it is. <laughs> and they give money. And therefore, that particular deity that blessed saint has to have her or his statue in the, I'm being apocryphal, in the niche. Something is there so that you know that your money was spent so other people will have their gout fixed. We do the same thing today. But the Pope said, you don't need aisles in this church. Why aisles are there? For two purposes only. He stopped. 
And Michelangelo said, for what? And he said, for the printing of illegal money, counterfeit money, and the raping of nuns <laughs> by the clergy. So that's, that was that. We, we have aisles today. Michelangelo won the fight because, you know, architects are forever and popes come and go. <laughs> but you've got to know about the hierarchy of spaces. When you walk back this, to this aisle, this corridor, to this classroom, think about what's happened in the 20th century. We've given that up. That's the only move you can make. You're designing this building, this room, those windows, that ceiling, this floor, and those doors. And that's all you can do is that corridor. There's paint. There's flooring material. There's something you can call attention to that paces you to finally get to this glorious class. But you give up so much as an architect when you just say, oh, I've got a budget, I can't do anything here. That's just BS. You're just letting yourself off the hook. You've got to do something. That's not to spend money. I'm talking about doing it without money. What can you do? What choices? Many times, you're just making choices. Because many times, you've got to get from A to B in the shortest dimension. Um, the shortest dimension reminds me of another true story. <laughs> I have a lot. Um, Philip Johnson, you all know who Johnson was, said about something that Walter Gropius said. Now, Walter Gropius was one of the most boring men that ever lived. <laughs> he had the idea of making a school. He couldn't draw, he couldn't think, he couldn't read. He wrote poorly, but he did do the Bauhaus. Yay, Bauhaus. All right. And he was an architect that cared very much about the shortest distance between A and B, because he knew that that would produce the cheapest building. And modern architecture was going to show the Beaux-Arts how to make a very efficient volume. Philip Johnson, on the other hand, said, I would rather walk, you know, oh, I have to say, do you all know what back-to-back -back plumbing is? <laughs> if you don't, and there might be one that doesn't. <laughs> if there is a party wall between his apartment and my apartment, party wall means we both share this same wall, that means the plumbing will probably be put in that wall, because you only have to draw the pipes up through once. His bathroom's on this side, mine's on that side. If not right there, somewhere on that wall. Back to back plumbing. So Philip Johnson said about, about uh, Walter Gropius, I'd rather walk, meaning a long distance, rather walk the, the, the length of Chartres Cathedral, which is about a quarter of a mile, to get to my destination than have back to back plumbing. So he was commenting on one kind of frugality versus the experience. Well, neither are quite right. But you do have to have the experience. Another question. Yes. We started with a really nice view of the landscape. And it, was, it struck me as a view of a, a space that someone or some people designed to cut out what looked like a, a very nice square and it plowed that ground. And then off in the landscape, it becomes more natural or more naturalistic. There's a nice juxtaposition. And then you talked about moving through cities, interior spaces and exterior spaces and so forth, public spaces. I was wondering if you were going to come full circle and maybe make some, perhaps address the idea that walking through buildings and cities had maybe some relationship to walking through landscapes of some kind? Well, I used that Irish landscape. I didn't tell you what it was. I used that landscape as a metaphor for just that. You all know that that forest beyond that tended landscape was one, at one time quite fierce. 
that was a very mean place. When you see, when you, you see the Knights of the Round Table in the movies of that period of medieval uh, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, and England, those forests were where the, the, the thieves hung out. So we didn't like that. And we wanted to find, a, we wanted to cut the forest down to make those spaces. We made them to, and bordered our buildings around them, a place where we would feel safe. And I say that because if you make that square big enough, you're actually making the city walls. We talk today about rustication. Do you know what rustication is? Well, I'll tell you. Rustication is the base of a building done in a heavier stone, done generally with a running bond. One stone here, the next stone here, next stone here, the fourth stone above the first one. That's a running bond because that's a very structural way of thinking about the wall. You will go through Italy, especially in Rome, and you'll see many palazzos with a rusticated base. That was a metaphor for the city wall. So if we build a, a row of buildings like Bath and put rustication on the outside, we're actually saying this is our protective device for the city against nature. We say today we're all for nature, but we weren't always like that. We were, there was this fearsome and cruel place out there. So we built city walls, and you know that there are ideal cities in, in Italy, which now are not destroyed, but very different now because people have built up next to the walls but they built bastions around the cities so that they could, protect, they could protect themselves. And there are studies done where those bastions are out in, in knife-like corners like this. This isn't modern architecture. That's to get the best shot of, of advancing Visigoths. <coughs> oh, yeah. And so you have all of these architects suggesting that they are a part of that city tradition by making rustication and that heavier wall. But it, it doesn't just end with landscape as a good thing. Landscape in your knowledge as a place to be. I went out in, the, in my little courtyard in my house uh, yesterday before while I was waiting to be picked up to come here. And the air was so fresh, and I knew we didn't have many more days. And I looked out at the, we have a town park on the other side of my fence. And I realized that that, that town park was going to lose all its leaves, was going to be covered in sun, the town's children will make snow angels out there, and the whole cycle will continue. But I also thought about the time when I couldn't go over the fence for fear of what would happen. Our cities are like that today. Now every building is a wall. That wall is the metal detector as we go through. Question in the back over there. Right. Over here, yeah. or? Building on your- Back there? Back here, yeah. All right. Building on your talk of public spaces and how you're describing them, you see a lot of movement in some areas to really create more communal spaces, both in different kinds of living situations with a lot of families and in towns. And there's a variety. Some seem well designed as opposed to others. But there's also, it seems like a reluctancy on a lot of people to actually go out and be a part of that common space, that they tend to take themselves away from it. Well, you're right. It, it, it takes all types, but every weekend, uh, Saturday and Sunday, um, my nurse and I walk, I call it walking, I'm in my chair. We walk up on Nassau Street, which is the main street in Princeton. I, I think about a quarter of the town is there. 
There's a Starbucks. There are a lot of restaurants. There are jazz musicians. There are people that are making that ground plane habitable by the use of the activity inside the city walls, inside Starbucks, outside of Starbucks, and the bookstore. And you're very likely to meet somebody you know. But we have a situation where that wall of those people feeling tentative in our cities has been broken down because it's such a welcoming place. It's not phony. It's not, it's not, pardon me, it's not a ball that you've been made to go have a coffee in. It's taking advantage of what the mall is to us and putting it back in the city. It works both ways. Our mall happens to be a very interesting high street. So we have on one side of our mall, which is Nassau Street, we have the university and 17th, 18th, 19th century buildings. And then on the other side, we have all the restaurants and bars and, and all of that, bookstores. And we don't have to go out, on, get in the car, go to Route 1, go to Bloomingdale's, come back to get a coffee. We've got it at our front door. So that's very nice. And I suspect, if it, we, I started out by saying something about Detroit and the cars. If we hadn't had the cars, we would have had more villages like Princeton, more walkable places. Not that that's the best of all possible worlds. There are things you get to in automobiles which I wouldn't hope to get to in Princeton. I, I can't afford to go to a, to a Phillies game or a Giants game without getting into a car. Princeton's not going to have something like that. But it is going to have the Princeton Tigers play if I'm a sports freak, which I am. And so I could go to a, a game. But if I want to go to big time stuff, I go to the bigger city. Nothing more appropriate. Then I want to get on the train and do it in 20 minutes. And if we had that train, as the president wants, we'd all get there in 20 minutes. But something's gone wrong. We've got this question of no. We don't have any cojones. <laughs> we just are sitting there letting the no guy say, and if you don't think this is all political, you're wrong. The longer I'm paralyzed, the more political I see everything, especially health care. So we've taken on health care in our office big time from the patient room, which is a disaster, to the furniture, to the lobbies, to the ambulatory care facilities outside the hospital. Uh, we should really end because he's getting a little tense. Another question? There's one more back here. Back here, yes. Uh, at the beginning of your lecture, you uh, introduced the uh, Noli plan and uh, how that kind of um, uh, gives us gives us an understanding of how the city uh, was, you know, understood in those times, and uh, you know, basically the city as existing as a as a single unit as opposed to a number of buildings. Um, but I, I want to get an idea of what, of what you think the consequences are of the city being understood as a series of private spaces now. Well, I the last couple of slides I showed of the transit village and and West Palm Beach is a pretty good idea of what I think this, the private city could be. One of the things that the private city will never be is completely private because we have retail. We have bookstores. We have Starbucks. We have entries to lobbies of our, our hotels, our, our condominiums and all of that. So I don't think it'll ever be purely private. But it isn't as public as I would love it to be, and I think we would all love it to be. But we're not that safe in our community today. So little by little, we have to take it back. 
but it isn't, it isn't a revolution that's going to happen in our, in our lifetimes. Something that we can't imagine might happen in terms of technology, which will make our city safer. I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm not a soothsayer. But I know that we, we talk about the new city. We talk about the new architecture. And I know nothing is new in architecture but technology. So don't be fooled to think that concepts of aesthetics are new. They are other. Picasso discovered cubism. He didn't invent cubism. He discovered a way of talking about it. And it's not really cubism. It's an allusion to other surfaces in the, in the figure of, and the ground of the painting. But I, I get very tired of people talking about the zeitgeist, we must be of our time. If we are of our time, I don't want to come back in 20 years and see a building I made of today and it had to represent today. I want to represent us. I want to represent our movement, our myths, our rituals in our buildings. The buildings will take care of themselves. Otherwise, it's styling. You've been trapped by You've been trapped by fashion, which must change you know, the height of the skirt every year because they can't sell the next skirt. We don't treat architecture that way. You can't do it. It's too expensive. Thank God. Any other questions? Well, we are going to continue this tonight. I would just like to answer uh, Michael in one instance. <laughs> one, uh, one little zinger. This is your, by the way, it's your it. class, so you can do that. Pardon? It's your class, so you can do that. Yes, it's <laughs> uh, The design that he's done is very interesting. And the idea of the quarter and the walking area and so on is interesting. The difference is, is that we handle a quarter million people in a weekend, and he wouldn't know what to do with the quarter million. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Why does he get the last? It's his class. Thank you. He doesn't know what to do. You know. See you next week.